Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, just a quick thank you to the Howard Foundation, to John and the, all of the other organizers for an absolutely super meeting. I found this incredibly informative, very, very enjoyable. In fact, I've enjoyed everything about it apart from the headache I woke up with this morning, I'm afraid. And I think a few of us are probably in the same boat. Okay, well, um, I would like to um, start by just uh, reminding us of a few facts about global blindness, and I, I, I hardly need to emphasize all of these uh, facts to an audience like this. But of course, the lamentable fact is that at least 70% of global blindness is entirely preventable. Uh, glaucoma and its open angle forms, uh, uh, cataract, uh, straightforward infection, totally preventable. And this situation, of course, recurs time and time again the world over. In this part of the world, of course, we are faced with in the degenerative retinopathies. Um, in the working age population, hereditary retinopathies um, are the most prevalent cause of registered blindness. The genetic heterogeneity here is just unbelievable. Uh, I spent three decades working on these hereditary conditions, uh, principally retinitis pigmentosa. There are at least 200 loci involved in these hereditary diseases. I think most of us working in this area probably would anticipate that there are perhaps 200 more loci yet to be discovered. Incredible genetic heterogeneity. Of course, in the older population, we have AMD and followed by proliferative diabetic retinopathy are the major causes, of course, of registered blindness. In regard to prevention, there are um, major, major limitations, which I'd like to try and emphasize in the slide. Um, there are no therapies currently uh, in place for uh, the treatment of the non-exudative form of AMD. Um, of course, this is 80% of all cases. Uh, no means of preventing progression of dry to wet, apart, of course, from diet, uh, macular pigment supplementation, keeping one's blood pressure under control, smoking, cholesterol, and so forth. In terms of treating the exudative form of disease, of course, we have the anti-VEGF agents, which have been in place for quite some time and have given great benefit to people. However, there are, again, major limitations in regard to their use. They're invasive, um, regular, uh, sometimes monthly inoculations of anti-VEGF agents such as Lucentis, perhaps less frequently for ILEA, the newer one. Um, very, very expensive. Um, on average, a thousand uh, pounds per injection, for example. Um, they only target established neovascular disease. And indeed, each injection carries with it a low but, in fact, significant risk of endophthalmitis, um, retinal hemorrhage, retinal detachment, and so forth. And indeed, there are no endpoints for therapy. Uh, there are patients who have received well up above 150, 200 injections of, of Lucentis, for example. So I hope I've emphasized the fact that there are limitations associated with both development of therapies for dry AMD, prevention of dry to wet, and indeed for the wet form of disease. So I'm going to talk about two things, largely about how we can modulate cerebral barriers, both the brain and uh, inner blood retina barriers, to get potentially protective compounds into the eye and indeed the brain. So most of the time I'm going to spend on this, but I'm just going to briefly visit um, a more recent development, uh, and that is the potential for a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Uh, uh, IL-18 as a means of systemic treatment, uh, prevention of, of choroidal neovascularization, which is a, a project which is under intense investigation at the present time in our own labs. So here's the problem. There are a very large number of very well characterized low molecular weight drugs which could be used to prevent uh, a retinal degeneration, drugs which target uh, oxygen-free radicals, oxidative stress, apoptosis, various forms of cell death, uh, neovascular disease, um, misfolding and aggregation of mutant proteins. As we all know, neurons, misfolding and aggregation of, of proteins is anathema to the survival of neurons as per Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and indeed retinal degeneration. And there are many drugs out there which will target protein, uh, prevent protein misfolding and so on. So many of these drugs are available, but few of them are in systemic use because of one slight problem, and that is these drugs will simply not cross either the blood brain or the inner blood retina barrier. And so we're looking, actually this is a, a beautiful diseased retina as many of you <laughs> will recognize, but we're looking here at the inner blood retina barrier and the vessels, the inner, blood, the inner retinal vessels, 
are lined by endothelia, endothelial cells, which are very, very tightly joined together, stitched together with at least 20 pro complex of at least 20 proteins. And that stitching complex we refer to as the inner blood retina barrier. The blood brain barrier is almost identical in its molecular uh, architecture. So a number of years back, we, we formulated a very simple hypothesis to get drugs into the brain or the retina, or indeed when we desire to do so to get fluid out, because obviously oedema is a major pathological morbid feature of many neurological conditions. So here we have a mock-up of the tight junctions, two endothelial cells joined together by this complex of proteins. So we reasoned that if we down-regulated selective tight junction proteins, it might just be possible to permeabilize or, or loosen up the inner blood retina barrier or the blood brain barrier to a very limited extent, just enough to get drugs in and fluid out, but not enough to let larger potentially damaging molecules across. So we had 20 or 30 proteins to downregulate to try this out. And what I will describe is simply the results of downregulating one of these tight junction proteins, Claudin 5. So in other words, if we downregulate Claudin 5 at the tight junctions, we might be able to permeabilize reversibly the, the barriers to such an extent that small drugs will get across. Of course, if we do this, this has to be reversible, and we have to do no damage to the function or the structure, really, of, of these barriers, because they perform a critical function. They're there for a very important reason, to keep untoward stuff out. So we, there's a very fine balance here between manipulating these barriers in a reversible and highly controllable sense and doing damage. You have to be critically careful not to damage these barriers. So the original formula we used, we used RNA interference, and we designed uh, siRNA molecules targeting Claudin-5 transcripts. And the original formula was 20 micrograms of unmodified, chemically synthesized siRNA, complex to a carrier, and we used a carrier which is well known and is in clinical use, in vivo jet PEI, it's a polyethylenamine carrier, complex to PEI in a volume of about 400 microliters in mice. So 0.4 of a mil of this complex is injected into the tail vein of experimental animals. And after this, about 40 hours after the injection, the RNAi molecules, of course, make their way to the endothelia of the br brain and retinal uh, uh, vasculature and downregulate Claudin-5. And in so doing, about 40 hours after the sRNA goes in, you get a downregulation of Claudin-5, and that enables the barriers to open up just to about one kilodalton in molecular weight, and it's just what you want. The reason I'm talking about Claudin-5 is that's what Claudin-5 does. I'm not bothered describing what the other down regulations do. We want to limit this to a very, very precise and very limited opening, and Claudin-5 just does that. So we can get fluid out of the brain, or indeed, if we wish to get fluid out of the retina, we can do it using this technique, or we can use the technique to get small drugs in. So we wanted to try to select, here's just another example uh, of, of how this works. This is just an MRI image of gadolinium contrasting. Uh, the contrasting agent gadolinium is beginning to start entering the brain and the, the ocular cavities here at 48 hours, and the barriers have shut down again. So this is a, a reversible process which depends on the half-life of the sRNA, and it's very important when you're using RNA interference not to permanently express RNA interference in living systems because RNA interference is based on the microRNA pathway. The microRNA pathway controls the expression of about 30% of human genes. So it's very important not to sustain expression experimentally or in the therapeutic sense of RNA interference. You want to do it transiently to minimize the systemic effect on other transcripts. And here's an example of the downregulation. Here's Claudin-5 in the vasculature. At 24 hours, it's going down. And by 72 hours, Claudin-5 has come back again. So this is a transient modulation of the blood brain and inner blood retina barrier. Using this systemic approach, of course, you modulate both barriers at the same time. There's no selectivity. So we wanted to try and validate this in, in clinically relevant models of disease where acute intervention using a once-off injection of RNA interference into a peripheral vein would be entirely justifiable in order to save lives, basically. And the first, two, I'll just describe two of these validations. One is, uh, is, is cerebral edema induction following traumatic brain injury. Um, TBI, as we call it, is, is incredibly com uh, common. 1% uh, of all global mortality is caused by traumatic brain injury, either in car crashes or in wars and so forth. But uh, very, very common condition. And oedema is a, a very significant morbid feature of this condition. 
if you can alleviate cerebral edema in this disease, you're going a long way towards preventing it. Current treatments for TBI are archaic, in fact. They haven't changed in almost 100 years. Manitol can be used in a once-off basis, but there are huge complications. So you can model TBI in, in rodents, and this is by placing on the skull of a, a, an anesthetized animal a, an ultra-cold probe, and this will induce edema. And here we have just a color-enhanced MRI image of mice that have been treated systemically with a non-targeting sRNA, or alternatively with an sRNA down-regulating Claudin-5. And as you may be able to discern, with time, the lesion disappears in the treated animals that have the barrier modulated because the fluid isn't able to drain out. Basically, what happens in response to trauma, there's an initial massive breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Fluid goes out into the cerebral co compartment, but then the, the barrier reacts by resynthesizing its components. The fluid is then trapped in the cerebral compartment. So this method simply allows fluid to drain from the cerebral compartment. And indeed, animals treated in this way also have cognitive improvement as well. So we think that this may be an acute intervention for traumatic brain injury for alleviating cerebral edema, and that's under investigation. We tried one other um, acute um, indication as well, and this is for um, grade four glioblastomas. Um, to me, this is probably the most dangerous tumor of, in, in existence. Um, here uh, is a classic example where our colleague Jerry Grant has attempted to resection the entire tu tumor, which he essentially succeeded in doing. But even following complete resectioning, radiation and chemotherapy, life expectancy is only about 12 months. Um, and the current so-called wonder drug, TMO, will extend life by about three months. It's, it's, it's a critically serious condition. And the, the, the fundamental reason is the chemotherapeutic, the cytotoxic drug, simply will not go across the blood tumor barrier. This animal has been treated systemically with Claudin-5 to downregulate the barrier. This animal has got vehicle alone. And contrasting agent, gadolinium, molecular weight about 746, well within the size range of most cytotoxic drugs, floods the entire tumor mass using this technique. Now, systemic use of sRNA could well be justified in, in treating this condition. And animals thus treated, these are human glioblastoma cells growing in athymic mice. Animals so treated with temozolomide or indeed doxorubicin show improved survival. So this we want to get towards. Uh, phase 2A in people and a, a phase 1 trial, in fact, in healthy volunteers is being planned at the, at the moment. Um, of course, re regrettably, because of the fact that rodent sRNA targeting Claudin-5 has a single change in its base sequence to human, unfortunately, therefore, primate safety and toxicology has to be undertaken. And indeed, uh, I'm very pleased to say that primates tolerate this complex exceedingly well. This, this study was completed uh, in the latter part of 2012. This was a single dose uh, safety and toxicology study. Uh, multiple dose studies are, are currently in design as well. So the system works and it's tolerable, very, very tolerable, I'm, I'm glad to say. However, if we want to target the retina, we have to be a bit more specific. Um, we don't want to target the brain at the same time. We don't want to flood the brain with something we're putting into the retina, if we can avoid it. Um, we need to leave the barriers fully functional, as I've emphasized before. There's no negative impact on retinal function or structure, and you have to have it controllable. You, you need to open and close, permeabilize and depermeabilize these barriers as you want it prior to delivery of drugs on a periodic basis. So there are, there are all these uh, issues that have to be addressed in targeting the retina exclusive of the brain. The way you do this, the way we've designed the, the technique to do this, is to inter integrate the barrier modulation machinery not in the form of an siRNA, but a short hairpin shRNA gene into an AAV9 vector. The vector is controllable in the sense that the gene is turned off all the time unless you feed the person or give the person an oral drug, uh, dox doxycycline, a harmless antibiotic. Uh, uh, and w when the antibiotic is administered, the uh, shRNA gene is activated for the period of time during which the person or the animal is on the harmless antibiotic. Take the person or the animal off, the barrier is shut down. So you can control permeability at the inner blood retina barrier very, very precisely using this viral system, um, which I've just described. And um, here's an example of how it works. And again, this is uh, color-enhanced uh, MRI imaging. Uh, this eye has received a, a non-targeting uh, uh, virus. This eye has received a targeting virus. Uh, and you can see the contrasting agent, gadolinium, molecular weight about 750, floods into the treated retina 
whereas the untreated retina with the systemically administered agent remains impermeable to the, the, the compound. So this is a very effective way of getting low molecular weight material from the peripheral circulation into the retina, exclusive of the brain. In terms of validation, one very early experiment we did was to validate this system in regard to light-induced retinal degeneration. We all know how sensitive our retinas are to light. Um, albino mice are particularly sensitive, and two hours exposure to bright light will basically destroy the entire retina in albino mice. And re retinal degeneration is calpane, cysteine, protein, a, cysteine protease, calpane dependent, in fact, and there are calpane inhibitors. One of them is ALLM, which is a molecular weight of about 400. It will not go across from the peripheral circulation into the retina. It's just too big to get across the barrier. So in this experiment, the mouse was systemically treated with ALM and then and with doxycycline to activate the virus. The left eye expresses the non-targeting AAV. In other words, the barrier remains unmodulated. The retina dies by apoptosis. This is tunnel staining. The right eye expresses Claudin-5 virus. The barrier is modulated. The drug can get in, and you can cause the retina to be protected very effectively using that technique. There are more important, however, therapeutic applications. As I mentioned, I've spent decades studying degenerative retinopathies, inherited retinopathies, and many of these conditions are caused by m misfolding and aggregation of mutant proteins. A classic example is this early family we studied from Ireland, 50 affected people with this condition, RP, in this one family. The linkage data pointed us to rhodopsin causing this disease, and many rhodopsin mutations misfold, aggregate, and poison the photoreceptors. So this is a common form of, 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 of cell death, photoreceptor cell death, in many different forms of RP. This slide, unfortunately, has been slightly corrupted here for some reason. Um, and here's another example of uh, the um, barrier modulation working in real time this time, MRI imaging the uh, opening of the barrier in this eye. And this is the P23H rat. P23H mutations are a common cause of, of, of um, degeneration, uh, rhodopsin mutations. And, and indeed, uh, a drug, 17 uh, dmag works very effectively in inhibiting protein aggregation in this model system. These are EOG tracings of animals thus treated. The right eye has the modulated virus, and the, the EOG is improved. Uh, compared with the left eye, which has a, a non-modulating virus injected into it. In terms of suppressing choroidal neovascularization, um, laser-induced CNV, as many of us appreciate, is a universally accepted form of, 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 of modeling CNV. It, it involves VEGF. So the eyes of wild-type mice in this experiment were inoculated with Claudin-5 virus and, uh, in one eye, non-targeting virus in the other. The animals were fed doxycycline and drinking water to activate the viruses. We induced CNV by uh, laser burns, and then four days after the laser burns, the animals received sinitinib, which is a VEGF receptor antagonist. Now, this normally will not go across into the retina unless the barrier is modulated. And in this case, the left eye got the non-targeting AAV, the right eye the AAV expressing the modulation machinery, and both animals got DOX. Both animals were systemically treated with the drug, uh, sinitinib, and the CNV is inhibited in the animal that gets the modulated barrier. Um, now, the moral of this is that there are a huge number of compounds that could be delivered to the retina using this sort of technology. I had not considered, in fact, lutein and zeaxanthin because I had imagined that the transporter machinery was so effective in getting huge concentrations of this stuff into the macula that you wouldn't need to bother to stimulate its uptake from the peripheral circulation. However, having experienced what I've heard at this meeting, I'm not so sure that that's the case, in fact. There may be, indeed, a case for stimulating the uptake of zeaxanthin and, and lutein using this sort of system. But there are many others. XJB, for example, recently reported by Cynthia McMurray. Fantastic um, antioxidant properties targeting the mitochondria. There are others. Platelet-activating factor receptor antagonists. This has just been reported by a group from Japan in plot the latest version of uh, the latest issue of PLOS One, and so on. Many of these drugs could be used, and indeed we are using uh, a selected number of these in preventing retinal degenerations using this sort of technology. I just want to finish very, very briefly uh, by uh, as a humble Mendelian geneticist trying to put on an immunologist, a cell biologist, and a biochemical biochemist hat for a moment or two, just to describe some of the work that's going on in our lab on targeting suppression of CMV in, in AMD uh, by trying to extend our knowledge of the molecular pathology of this condition. Now, we know already from, 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 from previous talk 
of course, that um, genetic risk factors have been well identified in genes encoding complement factors like uh, FB, C2, CFH. In fact, the CFH risk allele, Y402H, um, we now know has a reduced capacity for malondialdehyde, for example, a pro-inflammatory product of lipid peroxidation, which poisons the retina. So the very, very strong indication as to how, at least in part, how this variant works in, in causing degeneration, not, not the complete uh, scenario by any means. But we now have evidence that the NLRP3 inflammasome in macrophages, which are resident in or visiting Brooks membrane, um, can be primed by carboxyethylpyrrole. Now, CEP is an oxidative stress-related modification of proteins, which is very, very common in serum and in drusen from people with, 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 with AMD, uh, very abundant in, in AMD. So we can prime the NALP3 inflammasome using, by, by C, CEP, but we also know that, in fact, C1Q and indeed drusen itself can actually activate the NALP3 inflammasome and, and in so doing, cleave pro-IL-18 in these cells, these, in these visiting cells or resident cells, into the active form, the, 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 the actual cytokine IL-18, which is then secreted from these cells. So what's the implication of that? Well, the implication is, in fact, we now know that IL-18 is a, is a massively potent suppressor of choroidal vascularization. Uh, we know that, uh, for example, treatment of RPE cells and indeed endothelial, vascular endothelial cells with very small amounts of IL-18 is a potent suppressor of VEGF. We know that NALT3 protects against laser-induced CNV. We know that, in fact, lesions, CNV lesions, are much greater in IL-18 knockout mice than in wild-type mice, and we know that inoculating IL-18 antibody directly into the globe of the eye will, in fact, exacerbate CNV. The moral is, in fact, we now know that systemic, very low dose systemic IL-18 treatment, and we're talking about very low doses of this stuff, is a potent suppressor of choroidal neovascularization in animal systems. And I think the implication of this is that systemic, periodic, low dose IL-18 therapy may represent a very, very potent and very effective non-invasive method of preventing the development of CNV or, or, or controlling its development. And this, of course, is a project which is under intensive investigation at the current time in our own laboratories. Um, I'd just like to say that this work was spearheaded by my colleague Matt Campbell, Sarah Doyle, Marion Humphreys, who did the viral work, uh, Anna Sophia Kayang, with the assistance of our ABLE students, Anne Nguyen, Emma Ozaki, James Keeney, and Finn Hanrahan. The electroretinography was done by Paul Kenner. And I would just like to um, acknowledge the Science Foundation Ireland, Enterprise Ireland, Health Research Board of Ireland, the Wellcome Trust, Fighting Blindness Ireland, and the US Defense Department for supporting the work on barrier modulation. And the AMD project was started with a, a very generous grant from the American Health Assistance Foundation. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. Uh, any, any questions? from the audience. I think I've put everybody to sleep. <laughs> yes, please. Hello. Um, might opening up the tight junctions allow the waste products, for example, the ones that are stored in Drusen, to um, escape the, the macula more easily. Not the macula, sorry, the retina more easily. Okay, um, I think, unfortunately, my left ear was deafened recently in a car accident and, and PA systems don't work very well for me at the moment. I think what you said was that does this barrier modulation technology allow drusen components to, to get out of the, of the eye? It. No, it doesn't because um, the Claudin 5 down regulation only allows the barrier to be opened marginally to very, very low molecular weight compounds, no bigger than the size of, say, two DNA base pairs. So all of the components of Drusen are, in fact, much bigger than that, and they, they cannot be cleared using this system. Now, we are developing this system in regard to draining stuff like amyloid beta-40 out of the brain. And to do that, you've got to downregulate multiple tight junction components. And it's a bit of a balancing act because too much modulation, and you're going to let everything in and out, too little and it won't get through. But certainly Drusen and its components will not get out using this system. Yeah. Thank you. Further questions? Just one, maybe may very simple. Uh, when do you think this uh, system 
could be available for our clinicians. Yeah, um, the, the acute intervention, um, we hope will go through normal, vo normal human volunteer trial within the next 12 months. This is obligatory before it could be deployed in, a, in an acute sense. Then it will require a phase 2A study, mm -hmm. and that's, I would say, at least three years away from today's date to completion. In terms of the viral system, uh, it's a challenge because not only are we using an AAV, uh, we're using an shRNA, we're using a bacterial component to suppress the shRNA, and we have to inject it into the eye. Okay. So getting this through the regulatory bodies, the FDA, the European Medicines Agency, yeah. and so forth, is, um, is, is certainly not to, uh, by any means impossible, but it, it's, a, it's, it's quite a, um, a, a process to do. And that process has been initiated with EMEA and is in the process of being initiated with FDA as well. Um, it will be a longer process than mm -hmm. the acute one, but we hope within a period of two to three years we may be able to get the, 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 the safety stuff started properly. Uh, there's a lot of primate work still to be done and it's be, being carried out at the moment. Okay. Unfortunately, as I've emphasized before, the, the, there's one base change between Claudin 5 in mouse, rat, and humans, and therefore going through primates, unfortunately, is a mandated scenario. We cannot get this into humans by just studying this phenomenon in rodents. It's got to go through a primate system, African green monkeys. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks.